Right, our next speaker is David Campy, and he is going to be talking about teaching kids to code using Python. Cool, excellent. So, hi everyone. Uh, is this mic level okay? Okay, sounds quite loud. Um, cool, so just, yes sir. Hard to see the screen. We have a magical chair who will turn down the lights for us. While that's happening, just who the hell am I? I'm a guy who really, really, really loves humanity and people, and who really, really loves code, and I want to see the two working together. Uh, for the last 14 years, I've been working in a company I created that does that, called Afrolabs, and we um, help startups to create code, so these nice little boxes that help create code. But on the side, we run code retreats to teach adults to code. We've created a lovely home for adults to code in, called our office. And we try to help kids to code um, for many reasons, um, a lot of them quite personal. But before I get into that, I'd just like to know, is anyone in this room already teaching or has taught a kid to code? One, two, three, this is wonderful, okay? Um, so what I hope to share today is then some patterns for those who have, and for those who haven't before, maybe to show you that it's not hard. Uh, it's not scary, it's not scary for you or for the kids, and, and let's see how we can get going. Um, myself, how did I learn to code? I learned to code because I had to, because you couldn't use this mystical thing called a computer in the 80s unless you knew how to type on it. So I had to learn to read, to learn to code, to learn to use the computer. And that has pretty much structured my life. And when I see a six, seven, or eight-year-old who is still getting through the basics of reading, copying code letter by letter, and forcing themselves to get better at typing because they want to get better at computer, that, that's a magic moment for me. And it happens. Um, so one of the things that I've learned in teaching kids to code is you can't. You can help kids learn to code. If ever you find yourself walking to a whiteboard or a chalkboard or a something to explain a concept or saying, hey guys, can you close the laptops? I want to tell you something. You're going to lose them so quickly. It's more, whoa, this is cool. And suddenly everyone gets up from the computers and comes to look at it. That's the moment in which we can help kids learn to code and show them the ways into these places to explore. Um, the, the goal for me with teaching kids to code isn't that we're trying to somehow be load their heads with all the programming language syntax. Because you've heard the word millennials and there'll be a word for after that and what the kids are today, we don't even know what they're gonna be. But the truth is their world is code. Our world is made of code. And when you've lived in that world and then find out the world is programmable, it's, it's a sudden whoa moment. You, your eyes are open, my world is programmable. I can create my world that I live in. Um, and that's really my goal with helping kids learn to code is to learn that their world is programmable. So whether they become a coder or an actuary or a house builder, they just know this programming thing is out there, they can explore it when they become an awkward teenager. But you, know, you start at seven, eight, nine, ten, so that when you're a teenager you can go. So let's play is the, is the core idea. And we have to find the fun inside coding, which we all know. We know the frustration, and we know the fun, and we know how it goes. Um, does anyone in here, sorry, okay, let's do it the other way around. Who in here actually codes on a semi-regular basis? Okay, cool, that's good. Um, just checking that we all kind of get, get what coding's about. So to start with, I'm gonna talk about a not Python coding. So there's a thing called Lightbot. Has anyone used or seen Lightbot before? Okay, so Lightbot is, um, I see someone in the back there. Lightbot is you drag the instructions on and you make a robot walk around a screen and turn on a light on the blue square and then you finish the levels. There's a whole bunch of levels. The first one is walk forward to a square, turn the light on, and yeah, you've done it. But it's frustrating because he goes the wrong place. It's uh, interesting because he does exactly what you tell him to do, so it's a lot like programming. And it quickly gets into what the feeling of programming is without doing it. Plus, you can go home and say, Mom, Today I programmed a robot. Uh, David said it's a virtual robot, which means it doesn't really exist in the real world, but it's only on the, on the internet. But I programmed a robot, I made him walk around and turn a light on on his head, which is pretty amazing. The other thing to think about when you're doing this is the games and things you'll find out there and the exercises you'll do go on a learning curve like this, but there's a lot of fun to be had at the beginning of the learning curve. So repeat level one a whole bunch of times if you're gonna use Lightbot. 
because in doing the stuff again, I mean, Dan Pink talks about autonomy, mastery, and purpose. If I do it again and I'm good at it, I enjoy it more. So always just make sure that we're finding this fun and we repeat. I'll share this presentation afterwards so you guys have the links for all of this stuff. But lightbox.com is there, which will push you to App Store apps. And if you go to the Flash version, you can play it in the browser. And if you go to the Hour of Code version, you can get a free demo, which I've never really seen expire. But another one is Sploder. Uh, Sploder's tagline is where games come true. Many times as kids, we've played games and we think, oh, I want to code to, to make games. And then you start coding and it seems infinitely far to make games. So Sploder is a place where you almost draw your games and then start to play with the variables. Again, it's fun. It's so fun that kids will draw it and spend 20% of the time making a level and 80% of the time playing the level. Now, I'm happy with that because they're, they're, they're living in a world they've created and then they'll say, I'll make the jump further, I'll make the jump smaller, can we make it? And they'll, then they'll come to you and they'll say, but wait, this isn't real programming. And I'll say to them, well, actually, this is how you would make a game because you would build all the layers up till you have a level designer and then you would use the level designer. It's plain <coughs> stupid to write a level in raw code. That's not how you're going to do it when you actually make a game. So this is what real game designers do is they build tools like this to get there. And once they've got a feeling for the frustration and it not working and, hey, I've been making things, uh, not in this deck because no good reason. Uh, another exercise that's very illustrative for me of getting away from coding, being, typing, uh, being learning all of the syntax and having to do stuff is if I asked you to help teach a kid to do a website, You'd probably start with HTML because that's pretty straightforward and H1s and all that. What I found the best way to teach a kid to make a website is to point them to WordPress.com. They fill in a form and 10 minutes later they've made a website. You could go home and say, Mom, if you type this in, you can see my website. I've made a website. I can change things. I can post blog posts on it. I can do everything. And oh yeah, I'm going to learn how to change how things look. But I've just made a website. So a lot of this is also just getting to feedback as fast as possible. So. Another thing that I've mentioned, don't get to the whiteboard. So show them code, show them things working. Don't tell them. I've, I've, I've been teaching kids to code since PyCon 2012 when I met Sam, who was 11 and in the same boat as me. Now, that boat was for Sam was he'd reached the threshold of what anybody could teach him, and he was stuck, and he'd managed to convince him, his dad to get him to PyCon so he could learn a bit more about Python. And I said to him, come to my office on a Tuesday afternoon, and you sit in the boardroom, and if there's any problems, you come and ask me, and I'll help you through. Now, why did I choose that pattern? Because when I was 11, I had my parents' office across the swimming pool filled with engineers with some of the only Apple IIEs in the countries when I, from where I was four, five, six. When I was turned five, I got given my own computer to get me out of the office. And this was wonderful. But what happened when I was 11 is both personally sad and an interesting learning experience. My parents got divorced. And that environment went away for me. And for a year, I lived at my grandparents' house in a basement with an XT that I was super privileged to have an XT, but I could kind of get through the batch scripting that I understood, some of the basic stuff. And I sat there with a piece of paper hacking out ASCII codes because I didn't know how to find out what the codes were. And I knew more than my school teacher. Um, he used to ask me for help for unzipping things. And, and I was stuck until I moved from my grandparents' place to a place where I had a friend who could help me code. And then I came um, to Joburg, where there's a coding community, there's a demo community, we were doing C++ games, but there were no adults. And there was no one to help us pathfind our way through this thing. And then, you know, when I got to this university thing, I found that actually I knew more already than most of the people teaching us what we were doing around, you know, the functional coding that I wanted to do. So it was like, how do I get a network? So then when I saw Sam, I was like, he's there, he's 11. What could he do now? I mean, he's now going into a mechatronics um, degree. Uh, he's super happy about it, but he can, he can also code. He's made a whole bunch of websites, done some apps with his dad. And, and that's really interesting for me personally that I was able to help him. But what happened was he came to my office on a Tuesday afternoon, and I said, I'll come there. What did I do? I spent the whole two hours with him. And the next week, he brought some friends. And before you know it, 15 kids were trying to cram into our boardroom. We had the boardroom of ours and our boardroom next door going. And it's really, it just happens. It's really easy to do. Um, and a lot of fun. So in terms of show, don't tell, 
I've got a bunch of examples to show you, and then I'm going to do it interactively. Um, today's presentation timing, I'm not super clear on because I got upgraded today from a lightning talk to a full talk, so I'm just going to work through some of these examples that I've added in and then show you how things work. Python, a turtle is something worth spending time on. Has anyone ever imported turtle and used it before? Okay. Does anybody have a laptop with them right now who hasn't? Because it, doing this is a special kind of magic. Python is a batteries included language. What that means is cool things come with it. And one of them is Turtle. And Turtle is kind of phenomenally cool because you import Turtle and then you go wn equals turtle.screen. And suddenly you're out of console stuff and you just made a window appear. This window here pops up when you say Python equals w, uh, turtle, uh, wn equals turtle.screen. You can say whatever you like before it, but you tell them to type that in. There's a Hello Little Turtles chapter that you can check online that has all the things that the kids can copy in while they're doing this. The bottom line is you make it appear. The next thing you do is you make a turtle appear, which is this little cursor on the screen. And then you say go forward and he moves forward. So keeping with the theme of the room, I have... Here's one I prepared earlier. I've created an Iron Python note, uh, uh, not Iron Python anymore, sorry, uh, Jupyter no notebook. So when you, uh, when you come into Jupyter, one of the things you'll notice is Turtle doesn't work. Um, but some nice person has written something called Mobile Chelonian. A uh, Chelonian is a turtle, so Mobile Chelonian is a moveable, moving turtle. Um, but if you import that as turtle, most other things work as planned. So first thing, a turtle appears when you run t equals turtle dot turtle. In this case, he's chosen to use the turtle shape. You can actually change that shape of the triangle, which is quite cool. You can make it a square or a circle or a triangle. Um, but then let's make him move. So you run it, and suddenly you've made something move on the screen. And at this moment, something magical happens for most kids. So we've imported turtle. Uh, I see some people following along. So t or I normally let the kids use the first letter of their name. So in my case, d equals turtle dot turtle. What do we want David to do? D dot forward 100, d dot left 90. Forward. And they go, wow, it moves. And then they say, mm, can I draw a square? And, and generally at this point, I take, there's a wonderful tech talk called Building a School in the Clouds, where Sugata Mitra talks about his newly evolved pedagogical techniques, which is just walking away. So the best approach here is to say, I don't know, try, and just walk away. And when you walk away and you come back, eventually you see someone run a little bit of code that looks like this, lots of duplication, you know, haven't learned about for loops, don't even know what they're doing. They've just typed an instruction in a bunch of times, but they've drawn a square. And then they say, hmm, how do I draw a triangle? And, and if you're eight, you don't know about degrees. You don't know what these numbers are, and you don't know what anything is. And I, I, was, uh, I still remember the name, Christopher Blackburn was the guy who taught me, when I finally got to school, there was a course on Turtle. And he, wrote, he ran Christopher Blackburn's Program Academy, and there was Turtle there. And I was little, and I'd been playing on computers a lot, and I used to swap FD and DF. So I had to go to the psychologist, because I thought I might be dyslexic, because I was in such a hurry that I kept typing DF. But I never forget that moment, because FD was forward in the Commodore 64 Turtle. And he showed us how to do Turtle, and this idea that you could start drawing and having fun and interacting is really great. But also, at that age, you don't know what these things are. So I say to them, change the numbers and see what happens. How are you going to draw a turtle, so, uh, a triangle? So, oh, OK, I'm not going to, I say change the left numbers. So of course I'm going to make a mistake here, because we have to make mistakes when we're coding. So 50, 40, 90, what's going to happen? Well, he's not going to turn as much as I thought. I need him to turn more. How much, Dave, Dave, how much must it turn by? I don't know. Why don't you try? And they'll figure it out. They'll play with different numbers, make some longer, make some shorter. And at the end of the day, they've vic they have victory over a triangle and say, can I do a house? Maybe you can try, but it's, it's, it's 5 o'clock. Off you go. Come back next time. What haven't they done? They haven't created files. They haven't learned, like, run Python, run a file. They haven't done any of that cra crazy Java boilerplate stuff. They haven't had to create a class. They haven't had to do anything. They've just been able to code and enjoy it. Next time they come back, they haven't saved anything either. So they do it again. 
By the third or fourth time, they start to ask, is there a way I can sort of save, or one of their friends will tell them, and then you can teach them about files. And that's amazing. But each time I ask them, well, draw me a square, draw me a triangle, draw me a house, and on they got them saved, just click, click, droop. Oh, look, there's my square, click, click, there's my triangle, there's my house. And I'm suddenly I'm programming, moving beyond coding to programming. So that's, I mean, that's a lot of fun. And then, of course, we're all interested in what else we can do. So when we want to teach kids more, I talk about what's a level two square. So draw me a square again today, but level two is use a loop. So I'm not going to run this because it's pretty obvious what's going to happen is we're going to get a loop. Uh, we're going to get a square. Oh, why don't I? Because I can talk about it. So while he draws that square, I've also put the speed up, and I've run square twice using a function. Um, and they're like, oh, that's cool. And then you move into, well, you've drawn triangles and you've drawn squares. Maybe you could do a shape function thing that takes in a number of parameters. And this is like leveling up again on square. And you draw a square. And then you say, well, can you draw different shapes? And then you build a for loop on drawing different shapes. And soon your turtle's whizzing around doing all sorts of fun stuff. And you're making art, um, and you wonder about what sort of things you could draw. And it's really engaging and a hang of a lot of fun. Uh, it's even just fun to watch him whiz around. Uh, unfortunately, in, in Jupyter Notebook, you have to watch him whiz till the end. So, because if you hit stop, it gives you this weird kernel thing, which is worth seeing anyway. It's interrupting the kernel, and then it thinks it's interrupted, and then it hasn't. So if you try this at home, this is going to happen. Um, and if you run the next one and you use the same variable name, of course they play with one another, and then one turtle moves the other turtle. So um, there's a code sample there, and then a refactored code sample here using a color thing with size that I'm just going to show you um, based on something that some kids were playing with around how do I change colors. And you just assist them each step of the way when they ask hard questions and say, can I draw a small circle? But also there's emergent stuff that happens when you play with with turtle like this. So now when you draw the same tur circle and you keep turning, you actually get this little circle pattern inside of a circle that happens and everyone says, whoa, that's amazing. But now we close that window because it is time to move on. Um, so I've spent some time on turtle because it is something that I do a lot and the Hello Little Turtles tutorial that you find online gives you little code samples which you can copy in and you can pretty much leave a kid with that tutorial, they copy it in, and you need to just help them through, and you can do a class of 10 children and just move them through, and it's wonderful. But once they get past that, or if they're a bit older and comfortable reading and playing games, there's a nice platform called Code Combat, which is, again, that's something you can send kids to take home because there's absolutely no reason that you can't do this anywhere. It steps you through step by step, and if they get stuck with their homework, they can come back and say, ah, I couldn't do this hard problem. What does it look like? Uh, you, the first level is a dungeon like this, just like a, any other game you play, but you don't move it with the mouse or the keys, you move it with code. And so this quest is one that uh, requires you to avoid the fireballs, um, and it's teaching us about a, a while true loop, which is going to run forever, so you have to dodge the fireballs forever in under four statements, and that is hard. Because how do I dodge fireballs forever when I've only got four statements? Well, it's a magical thing called a loop. And they literally say, just type self.move left. Here, OK. And it's auto-completed the brackets there. But I just want to show you some fun stuff. Like if you run it without the brackets, you get the little duck saying, fix your code. Um, move left has no effect. It needs parentheses, self.move left. Um, this has been a Y Combinator funded project. So they've done quite well in terms of polish and making everything nice and testing. So it's actually a really nice environment, and it gets really hard. Um, the free stuff gets you through the basics of coding, but you can see Anya here, you get to choose girl heroes or boy heroes or brown heroes or white heroes, and you know, all the things that make it nice to identify with, you get to do. Uh, similarly, in Lightbot, you can be a girl now as well. A pink robot or a blue robot makes a huge difference. It really does. And um, I have two young daughters, so it's become incredibly important to me to make sure that everything actually works as well for girls as it does for boys. Um, so after Code Combat and Turtle, we may want to move into hardware, because hardware is fun. Hardware is a lot of fun. And I grew up in the 80s when most computers connected to hardware. Now, my parents' computers connected to hardware 
like slide carousels. I don't know if anyone remembers slide and tape. You had these and they drop slides in. And multimedia in the 80s meant slide and tape, not DVDs. So they ran a multimedia production company. You had an eight-track tape, which would make a beep on the silent track, which would then advance your computer program to the next step, which would then turn all of these slide projectors. But the other things you could tro control were smoke machines, lasers, um, huge sound effects coming in, smoke bombs. And I grew up on these sets knowing about hardware and how much fun hardware was. So when I was at the robotics lab, which is one of the places we teach in Cape Town, and I saw these micro bits lying around, and they're essentially a little circuit board about this big. Um, you can get them in a box of eight for a coding club. There's different ways to load code on them, but I'm just showing you the Python way. I was very intrigued. And those are LEDs. So that's an array of LEDs, and what you can do with this is make lights blink. And most engineers will tell you that dust blinking lights is pretty much the foundation of all engineering. And it's got an accelerometer in, so you can turn it and make the lights blink differently. And that was going to be about the end of my talk on hardware until today I met Carl. Is Carl in the room? Carl's at the back there. And Carl said to me, well, you're talking about teaching kids to code. And I really love this little thing called the circuit playground from Ada. And the circuit playground is round, and it has a bunch of connectors on the side. It looks a bit like a micro bit, but the difference is that if you go to Carl's repo, you can actually preload it with a Python-friendly flash so that when you plug it into your computer, you then see a Python file on it, which you can program. Of course, programming is hard, and plugging in USB ports is harder. And so we wonder what the first program did. And Carl said, well, poke it. And as you poke it, you'll see the lights come on, which is pretty fun, right? And there's a program in there called code.py, which you, know, you have to remember to right click and then edit with idle. And then we're going to say, OK, um, ooh, my lights went off because I think the file must have changed, and it's reloading. And I'm going to change the color of the first one from a red, using my magical knowledge of RGB, to a green. I'm going to save this file. And then when I touch A1, this is the first day I've touched this thing, but you know, most kids would be the same. I get a blue light instead on there, which is pretty amazing. And then Carl pointed me to this thing, which is this welcome to circuit Python CPX thing, which is linked to from his GitHub repo, which is call fk slash CPX on GitHub. Um, and what happens there, and this is, I mean, this, this is the joy, and I, you can't capture the joy twice. You can't step into the same river twice, unfortunately. So I'm showing you today a little bit of what the kids will show you in terms of the joy. So in the CPX, I've made, I've made a copy of this tone piano thing. And full disclaimer, I have never run this before, so I don't know what's going to happen. So I'm going to rename it to code.py, because that's the secret knowledge Carl told me I had to do. And then I drag and drop it onto circuit.py and replace the file in the destination. And then, after it loads, I don't have a speaker. Boop. Nope. OK, so it is not working the way I wanted it to work, which is amazing, because I've just broken it. Um, I.e., I now have a piece of code on here that does something that I don't understand, and I have something to figure out. I was hoping to play you little um, piano tones. I know on the, on the micro bit, for example, you can do a really cool thing where you actually have to click the capture the ground and the V out cable. Maybe I'll start making sound now. And then you clip that onto a headphone jack, and then you can plug the headphone into your ear and you're listening to the voltage that it puts out, and that's how you make your sounds. Um, so this might be trying to do the same thing. Carl told me it should have a speaker on, but maybe the tone piano that I loaded on there is just not as. Yeah, I'm touching the touchpads, pushing the buttons. Anyway, it probably makes a sound at some point in the next 15 minutes. The tiny little reset button has been hit. It might get better, or it might not. Um, so what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to copy this URL, and I'm going to find another program. Ooh, let's go back. Click. Click on that URL. 
and hopefully through the inter-process communication. Um, I'm going to grab Blinky. And this is kind of the audacity of teaching code to kids as well, because oftentimes I will show them something that I have no idea how it works and say, please figure it out. You know more than me. And they go, oh, yes, sure, David. We know more than you. And then they come back and they say, uh, I don't know how to do this. And I say, neither do I. And they say, well, what do you mean you don't know how to do it? I say, well, not, well grown-ups don't know everything. And that's an important thing to learn. Grown-ups don't know everything. And secondly, you've been doing this for longer than me. So, for example, Sploder, I have never actually made a game in Sploder, sadly. I just never had time to. Um, so, what happens instead is I'll say, Bashy, won't you show uh, Tulula how to make a level in Sploder? And I'll say, oh, okay. Because normally we'll start a class um, with, what did you do last time? Mm, I can't remember. Okay, that's fine. What do you want to do today? This. Who wants to help them? Them. They cluster off, they go get together and do whatever they want to do. So now I've loaded Blinky. Oh, now Blinky clearly has a very advanced function. It's blinking the red LED. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, and, and the other thing with that is if you think about it for a second and you've pointed a kid to a website where they've downloaded a Python file from someone they don't know. I mean, it's actually Carl. No, it's not Carl, it's Carl's friend. But they don't know him. And they've downloaded a file, and they've put it on hardware, and they've run it. That's, that's also the magic of open source. And it, works. and it works. And a lot of coding focuses on this is a variable, this is a parameter, this is, this is a class. And uh, you know, did I really want to code? No, no, I don't want to do that. And luckily, I didn't learn to code that way, and I wasn't like my friends in high school who got scared away from coding by the well-meaning but not understanding the joy of code teachers. And uh, I, you know, I was also scared away from the well-meaning but not understanding the joy of code workspaces. Um, so after that, Raspberry Pis are great, and Kano is a kit to build your own computer. We've got a whole bunch of them at the robotics lab down in Cape Town. Every day you come in, you build your whole computer up, you plug it into a screen, and you get faster and faster, and then you run some coding exercise, and that's your day. Um, so finally, just an invitation to get started. Uh, either join a movement or start at home. Um, I've benefited from Im being involved in the Coder Dojo movement. Um, I started my club and then I found out about Coder Dojo and I was like, hey, we're doing something cool and it's similar. We're Dojo 113 and there's now 1,925 around the world. And it's just a pattern for free coding clubs run for young people by volunteers which are project-based and self-organized. Um, it's great and there is Coolest Projects which is a global thing that comes together. Um, find a dojo near you or start a dojo. Uh, and there's an open space on Friday where I can help answer all the questions about how and actually help you take the next steps. Um, Code Club, when you look at it, looks very similar to Code Dojo. They're so similar that they actually call themselves sisters and they were both adopted by the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Code Club is more scalable but different. It is more educator-aligned clubs so they can run closer to schools with assessments and run through a process. So Coda Dojo is this flavor that I really love of project-based, but we run some clubs. We run a club, for example, at Isipiwa's school in Kaya where they've got 80 computers, and now kids learn to code on a daily basis. You know, tons of kids are going through this, pro not tons, that's a lot, but 50-odd kids have now finished um, Code Combat, I think, and then they come through to the dojo if they really enjoy it, and we organize transport and that kind of thing. Hour of Code. So Hour of Code is both one annual event in the year during Computer Science Education Week, as well as a collection of lots and lots and lots and lots of activities to explore. So what I've shown, what's on the right there is, I think about 10% of the screenshot. I've used Chrome to take a full screenshot, and it's the only time I've ever seen Chrome say, uh, my full, screen, full page screenshot plugin say, this is too long and needs to be split into two images. I did that for this presentation, and of course I wasn't going to show you a long thin ribbon of stuff, but every one of those is an example. So you can definitely find something that interests the people that you're working with. 
Um, eh, of course, this has tried to disable my touch now. Um, but you'll find things from making ponies run across the screen to universe destruction and everything in between, making movies, anything vaguely code-related. Someone's made an exercise that you can kind of do in about an hour. Um, and so finally, I just advise you to get in touch. So there will be an open space in the foyer over there on Friday after lunch, um, which with, which with open space will be me sitting on a couch somewhere, helping people answer questions, helping you get your laptop set up. You can mail level up at afrolabs.co.za. Level up is our not-for-profit focused on getting all these initiatives going. Or just get hold of me. David Campy on Twitter is the best way to get my attention. And then we can connect elsewhere. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. I, I see we have some questions already. Great. And just just to remind that we have uh, prizes for good questions. <laughs> um, especially with young kids, I see like Coda Dojo starts at seven years old. How do you get younger kids excited, especially ones that don't necessarily can't necessarily um, grasp like full typing and stuff? Where, where's a good place to start with them? Um, yeah. So go to your community is the answer, yeah? <laughs> so I've got a seven-year-old. What I have done, I've, uh, there's an application on Ubuntu called Tux Typing. So it helps young kids learn how to type. So basically that's yeah. what I've done. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, so do you have kids of that age? Okay. Uh, I'll ask you the question again. How do you make your kids calm down? <laughs> Kids are naturally excited. We break them somehow by making them not excited. Um, and so what I've done, I've got a three-year-old and a five-year-old of my own now that I get lots of time with. And I've started by playing things like tower defense games, where balloons tower defense, where you put the monkeys in and they pop the balloons and they start to see that you can program the monkeys to pop the balloons. Um, and then we move on um, doing like Lego boost robot building um, you, you find the fun and you follow the fun. You know, that's the kind of thing. Never make it boring. And if they're bored, let them move on. Like, I would never punish them into coding. But if I do some turtle and I'll drive, and they're like, oh, can you draw this? Can you make these colors? I'm like, yeah, do you want to make that longer? How do I do that? 80. How do I write 80? Now, my daughter can just about write 80 now. But when she writes it and it works, she's super happy. And, you know, it, we don't have to go too fast. They're tiny. And they've got tons of time coming up ahead of them. Got another one? Um, is this working? Oh, um, I have a question, but I, I'm probably not going to frame it so just pr properly, so just bear with me. I'll give you a few tries. Okay. Um, so I have a seven-year-old uh, daughter, and she started um, coding, but like on one of these like web browser-based programs, um, Scratch. And um, I, I guess my question is around, like, I've given a like a low-end Microsoft computer um, that she uses, but she struggles with the efficiency of the computer. And so, like, I also don't want to just hand her, like, a MacBook because then I'm interfering with the school level um, c uh, teaching that's happening over there. So, uh, but, but I'm also, like, I'm hindering her from just getting on with learning the coding because now she's stuck battling with a, a very difficult system. So what advice or what do you recommend? Is that something I perhaps address with the school to say, hey, you know, she's a little bit more advanced than cool. that level? I mean, that's a good question. Um, in particular because Scratch is something that I forgot to mention. Uh, I forgot to mention it because I don't use it a hell of a lot. Um, mostly for that reason. Uh, you can install Scratch on the computer, which runs faster. So that's the first thing if she's enjoying Scratch. Um, and how to make Scratch interesting is to find projects to do. I had one girl who made a whole Romeo and Juliet scene when she was eight um, of Romeo talking to Juliet for ages. And a lot of it is just the practice. You don't want them to do hard things, just fun things. And, you know, he was there and then the background changed. But that's where Python is wonderful. You can <coughs> install Python as super low requirements and you can get to Turtle straight away. Um, the other thing I didn't show you, I don't know how much time we have for questions. Um, is, is that that coding is fun and it's surprisingly fun. So let me show you something. 
whoa, that is actually amazing. To us, that's not even a thing. But, you know, and then you show that to a little person and they're like, okay, can it do big ones? Ooh, okay, and that's quite interesting. But some go there, and I had another little boy sit there, and he typed in all the bonds tables. And I was fascinated. I let him do it, like 2 plus 3, 2 plus 4, test was fine. He tried it, and he was testing the computer. And he called his mom, and he said, Mom, Mom, someone put all the answers into the computer. <laughs> which amazed him. And then they asked, can I use this in my tests and all that, which is interesting. And then you go, like... Name equals, oh, don't do that, equals David. And you teach them that the quotes are important because if you don't put them in or if you put double quotes, it's going to complain at you in the red. Oh, it's broken. No, it's not. Just let's go grab it back again. It's fine. Okay, so what if you type name now? The computer knows your name. That's interesting. Okay, so what happens if you type name times five? And most of us have probably done this at some point. But first you ask them what they think is going to happen. And they say, you can't do that. And I say, well, what's going to happen? Oh, he has name times five. This is where the difference between boys and girls comes out. Boys say, can I do name times a thousand? And girls kind of just move up. You know, boys want to make things explode, and girls want to make things nice. So the girls say, can I put a space in between? And the boys say, what if I do name times maybe a hundred, so I don't want to break it. And then, then eventually you look away, and they've done this, and the computer's hung, and they're like, aha, I broke my computer, this is amazing! <laughs> you know, so there's a lot of joy hiding in there that we want to keep in there. Um, so I think the answer to the question, if the resources are low, just jump straight to Python. And you can you know, and look at the conference. You can do quite a bit with Python. And especially even just with batteries included Python that you can plug in and run. Um, Flash games, your mileage will vary. Code combat works OK on some things and not on other things. Same with Scratch, but install Scratch. Yeah. Um, that's about all I have to say about that. Like a microbit or something, that's also super amazing. And this little guy here is the Adafruit 3333. If you search for Adafruit 3333, it has $25. Uh, it's still running and blinking its light. It'll do that until you plug it in, but you can clip a DC battery on and it keeps doing it. And you can have a little night light in your bedroom making you happy. And, you know, so it's about finding creative ways. No, you don't need to buy a MacBook Pro. Um, I had one boy with an old MacBook Pro, actually Sam, the first one, had eventually broken his power button, didn't used to work, and he was so lazy that he had to reboot it that he used to use the screen to hold his finger on the power button because otherwise he'd get distracted and take his finger off while he was doing a hard reboot. So anyway, plenty of fun anecdotes, and it's the most fun thing <coughs> you can do is enjoy coding again, and you get back to work on money, you're like, can I get back to the kids? Anyway, any other questions? Are we done? Oh, yeah. Yo. Um, so, uh, my question relates to the aging. We're currently um, putting in a laboratory with um, CAD, 3D printing, programming, and robotics at a primary school. And our plan was to do grade four up until grade seven. Yep. So, um, a lot of the, the um, uh, what do you call the teachers were kind of, I, I want to say, freaked out by the idea of kids working with CAD. So, we tested this on a bunch of grade, grade threes, and one of the grade ones came along and ended up building like robots in Blender in a day. Yeah. Yeah. And we were like, oh, goodness, what? So our first thought was introducing the kids to Scratch at grade four, but now we're wondering at what point should we be taking them from Scratch to Python, and maybe we should doing, be doing this at age two or three so my, or something. My experience is to experiment with, with um, uh, again, I, I really, I mean, that's a good question that's important to realize. Kids from different backgrounds will have different expectations about what's hard, what's easy, and where they've learned. Homeschool kids versus formal school kids versus uh, over-resourced school kids versus under-resourced school kids. You'll find everything in between. My only answer is experiment. You know, let's play. Like, let's not think too much. We've got too much brain here. Just play. See what happens, you know. And you've done the right thing. That's, that's the best thing the younger they are, because Scratch has a lot of reading overhead. No one realizes that, because we read really fast. But if you have to choose the right block from Scratch, you have to read about 20 blocks, and that's horrible. Whereas if I can just type letter by letter, I don't even, I can't even, my, my five-year-old has typed in lily.forward100, but she's not even so good at reading the word forward. So that, that's the thing to remember. Like, she'll type it in until she knows what forward is before she knows what forward is. 
Yeah, so there's the, the command line, um, David Flip, I just forgot his name, David from the other software company in Cape Town in St. James, uh, and I started a little GitHub project which went nowhere, but the name was cool. It was called Clipbit, which is children learn interesting programming by interesting typing. And the idea was that when you're typing, you feel hardcore, you're a hacker, you're doing these things, but you can also learn it super early. And it just connects you with the, I don't know, the body or the mind of the beast, or whatever One it is. One last yeah. quick question. Yeah, I mean, I have, uh, thank you, that was interesting. I have a three-year-old. I haven't started uh, kind of uh, swinging her into some programming. But Two-year-old? Three-year-old three daughter, okay. three-year-old. So, I mean, I just want to kind of ask a slightly eth ethical question. I know we are programmers kind of uh, involuntarily we want to swing them into our lane. I mean, how do you keep them interested in the universe? I mean, be it arts, et cetera, et cetera, without inadvertently, you know, swaying them into your lane, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean... A, you're their parents, so they're going to follow in your footsteps anyway. You can't avoid it. Um, my, my kids have been, we go to the museum, we go to the beach, we try to get out, we try to do everything. Uh, I'm not big on avoiding screen time because I'm like, okay, do we want to physically handicap our children? Um, but screen time that's interactive is amazing. And I, I just feel, you know, personally, I love my lane. My wife's an occupational therapist, so I think between us we have some balance. Also with a one, two, three-year-old, what can you do if you have a Windows PC, Scott Hunselman, nice guy, um, has created this app a number of years ago called Baby Smash. And what does it do? It locks the screen with whatever's on behind it, and you can push characters, and it puts them up. So now your kid can play on the computer, move the mouse around, and if there was sound coming out, you'd probably hear some sounds. Oh, wait, I think I muted my speaker earlier. Oh, it's not coming out there. H. H, K, pink trapezoid. So yeah, it makes things appear on the screen, um, and you have to hit Alt F4 or Control Alt Shift O to get to the options. And then there's options in there, and you can change it from speech to laughs, which is normally where you start. Um, and then it makes little laughing sounds if it works. Yeah, so. You get little Scooby-Doo laughs and all sorts of things. It just makes it fun and makes the computer not scary. Um, but I haven't really contemplated my kids not being leveled up with coding skills because I don't care if they're an artist uh, doing generative art or a bricklayer or an accountant or a dancer. Not knowing that their world is programmable is going to be a handicap. If they don't like doing it when they're a teenager, then God bless them. Um, yeah, and. To all of you again, come on Friday. God bless you. Hope this makes it easier to teach coding. Yeah. Perfect. Let's thank David again. Thank you.